Good morning. Welcome to episode eight of Tea, Coffee, and Torah. I'm so glad you joined me this morning. This morning, I have something really fun I want to share with you. Um, I love history, and I'd like to share with you why I love history and how history and the knowledge of what was um, relevant, of what was popular during the day, can shed so much light on scripture and allow us to come away with a understanding of scripture that we would not have had before. So grab your cup of joe or your cup of tea. Uh, I am eight for eight on coffee this these mornings, but um, I do have my reviews ready to go, hopefully for Wednesday. And um, grab your cup of joe and join me. Uh, if you have some comments, I would really appreciate hearing them below. So just uh, enter them below and I would love to hear your thoughts. So this morning, I wanted to talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh and how Moses actually addresses a lot of the beliefs that are expressed in the Epic in Deuteronomy. And so Gilgamesh, let's go back to a historical setting, occurs right around the time of Abraham probably maybe even a little bit before Abraham, you find that the religions of the day start to kind of splinter. Um, everything starts to become bigger than life. And these stories are invented to pass knowledge down. Um, and also they're f fiction. Uh, they're fun. But you know, the, the thing with fiction is that it every all fiction needs just a little bit of truth to make it fun, to make it enjoyable. And that's actually what you find in a lot of your, um, in a lot of your mythology. Aesop's fables, for instance, uh, it's all about teaching. It's about teaching moral values. It's about teaching, um, skills and, but really about virtue and values. Um, but a lot of times in pagan religions, you know, you, you have the, the mysteries of Osiris. You, you, when you look throughout the ancient Near East, you have a lot of these religions where they would have initiation rites or they would have rituals that they would do. And at the end of the ritual, it's really not so much about the belief and believing in the ritual as it is the lessons that are learned from that ritual. So for this um, discussion today with Gilgamesh, I just want to kind of share with you some stories from the epic that really parallel the ideas that Moses um, attacks, the ideas that Moses confronts in Deuteronomy with the beliefs that were very, very popular during his day. So just some facts about Gilgamesh. Um, you know, he is a, a tyrannical ruler uh, in the beginning. And then he meets his, this friend, Enkidu, who takes and helps him discover friendship and makes him a better man for it. But Gilgamesh himself is one-third man and two-thirds god. So he, he's a demigod, kind of like Hercules. Uh, he is given to know the secret of, of all things, or at least many things. He is, has a perfect body. He is beautiful. And his father, the king of the gods, gives him kingship over people. He, in his hands, is the power to bind and to loose. Now, this is actually something that is kind of relevant um, because it's addressed actually in Isaiah as well regarding the beliefs of Cyrus and what he would have, the tradition he would have inherited as king of Persia, or actually even within the Persian Empire. So you find that Gilgamesh really has about a thousand to fifteen hundred year um, popularity where it is kind of the go-to story or epic of the day. Everybody knows about Gilgamesh, and obviously Moses does too. So you find that with Gilgamesh, uh, his friend in, uh, in, in, I have a hard time saying it, uh, and Endiku dies. And you find that with um, his death, Gilgamesh goes on this quest for eternal life. And with this quest, 
he has to do several things. One of the questions, actually, that Gilgamesh poses is whether or not a man needs to clamor into heaven. Uh, does a man need to ascend into heaven? And you find also some of the ideas that are expressed do resonate with Proverbs and even Ecclesiastes, um, just kind of normal literary genre where there is, you know, all of our days are kind of numbered, but they're as the breath of a wind. Um, you know, it could be that life is meaningless or just the fact that, you know, human life is fleeting because all of our days are, what, 80, 100, well, in modern era, we're about, what, 90, 100 years if we're lucky. And so Gilgamesh expresses some of these, or at least the epic expresses some of these ideas when he is um, reasoning through it. So after Enkidu's death, you find that Gilgamesh goes on a quest for eternal life. He crosses an ocean looking for eternal life. Um, he crosses over grasslands through wildernesses. Through the quest, he is, he learns to despise worldly goods. Um, worldly goods become very fleeting. He also goes beyond the sea looking for eternal life. And he meets a man who is claimed to have lived during the flood. And supposedly this man has the gift of eternal life, or at least a very, very long life. And what's interesting with this, when you put it in his, the historical setting um, of Abraham's time or before Abraham, Abraham, during his lifetime, Noah would have died when Abraham was 55 years old. At least that's according to the biblical chronology. Now, if Gilgamesh was written at this time, it's very possible that as a historical fiction, uh, Noah would have still been alive. So there's always a little bit of truth to mythology. But, you know, one of the critics that, or rather one of the criticisms that I hear among atheists, agnosticism, or agnostics, um, is that, you know, the Bible is full of mythology. Where do we separate, you know, what's truth and what isn't? Well, Moses really helps us do this because he tackles, he deals with the, um, the ideas embodied in the Epic of Gilgamesh head on in Deuteronomy 30. And so after Moses' command, and I'm sorry, my eyes water in this dry, dry weather. Um, in this epic of, or rather in Deuteronomy 30, Moses, after he states that Israel should turn to Yahweh with all his heart and with all his, their soul, this is what Moses addresses. And I'm going to read Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 through 17. And let me just share with you why this is relevant before I actually get into the text. When, uh, when, um, when Gilgamesh is on this quest for eternal life, at the very end of his quest, he is given a test. He can have eternal life if he does one thing. He has to stay awake for six days and six nights. Now, this is after he has, I mean, if you've, if you've seen Lord of the Rings and everything that Frodo went through to cast the ring um, into the furnace, Gilgamesh's quest was not unlike Frodo's. And at the end of that quest, he is very, very tired. So for him to stay awake for six days uh, and six nights is really, really difficult. And it's something that um, Gilgamesh cannot do. He falls asleep and he loses his access to eternal life. So it's something that was too difficult for Gilgamesh to do. So Moses now is going to contrast what Gilgamesh could not do to the law, the way of life, the instruction that Yahweh is giving to Israel. And this is what it, what Moses says. For this commandment, which I command you this day, is not hidden from you, neither is it far off. Now, the, the thing that you find with in most pagan uh, cults is that there's always a hidden, a secret knowledge, something that you have to dig for. You know, in some ways, you know, the modern Kabbalah movement kind of parallels um, this ideology is that it's, it's hidden and not everybody can find it. 
So it's not in heaven that you should say, who shall go up for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Now, remember, this is Gilgamesh's question is who will go up into heaven? Then neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Gilgamesh crosses the sea. But the word is very close to you. It's in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. Now, this totally counters the test that Gilgamesh was given that was too hard for him. So unlike Gilgamesh's quest and Gilgamesh's test that was too difficult, the, te the test and the instruction, the way of life that Yahweh gives to Israel is something that's very easy to do. And then Moses goes on to say, See, I've set before you this day life and death, good and evil, in that I command you this day to love Yahweh your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. Remember what we talked about previously about multiplying? Um, having children and multiplying is what the foundation of the Abrahamic covenants. And Yahweh your God will bless you in the land where you go to possess it. But if your heart turns away, so you will not hear, but you are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I denounce you this day that you will surely perish and that you will not prolong your days in the land where you go to possess it over the Jordan. Now, this is interesting because Moses is again confronting head on the pagan ideology of his days. He's denouncing if you worship Gilgamesh's gods, if you believe in that pagan mythology, then you will perish on the land. Because if you are following that, you are not going to be following Torah. You're not going to be defile, following the divine law and Yahweh's instructions and his way of life. So there is a direct contrast here. So just because scripture um, it discusses pagan mythology, what we see here is Moses utterly denouncing it and putting a separation between the beliefs of his day versus the instruction that Yahweh was given to Israel. So this is something that, you know, if you've ever struggled with, you know, parallels in scripture, this is, should be something that's very, very encouraging. Now, it's also very relevant to take this teaching and apply it to other things, other belief systems. My eyes are watering here. Um, because you find that the beliefs are solid. They don't change. Um, nobody needs to go get the law for us. Nobody needs to do it for us. It's something that is very easy for us to do. And in fact, I often say that the liberty of Torah, what Yahweh did with the Torah, is that he established an I can an I can do religion. Um, and that is something that makes each and every person individually strong because you don't need man to do anything for you. When we are taught that we cannot do, that we have to rely on somebody else, that somebody else then stands in the stead of God and they have the power because then we look to them for the authority rather than looking to what is written. Um, something that the early uh, Protestant reformers called Sola Scriptura. And when we rely on the written word, we are empowered, each and every one of us, to become messiahs, to not put off today to tomorrow what we can do today. So I hope you're encouraged by this. I hope it brings your scripture study alive. We're going to delve into some more ideas next week, and I hope that you will join me for another episode of Tea, Coffee, and Torah. Have a fantastic day and a wonderful weekend.